people. Now, what we want to talk about today, as we've been doing as part of our service, is to understand what we have to deal with in practice regarding fibromyalgia. Now, patients come to us in a lot of discomfort, and a lot of pain, uh, where the diagnosis of fibromyalgia turns out to be the implicating cause. Now, whether the inflammatory state of the individual is caused by just a mitochondrial deficiency or a neurological disorder or a thing called central sensitization, meaning super sensitive nerves, uh, we want to figure out what is the cause. Now, today, we're going to be talking about a little bit about the pathophysiology, a little bit about the nutritional components, but I'm going to be bringing in Ana. Ana, Ana Paola Rodriguez Arciniegas to basically discuss a little bit about the concepts of nutritional applications for the person suffering fibromyalgia. Now, when I say that, this is not a dogmatic point of view. It is a point of view that uh, is by research. And what we want to do is we want to put the best options forward for the individual, because sometimes the doctors will give you after a large series of assessments from clinical assessments to laboratories, and they come to the road and they say, you got fibromyalgia, of which it's easy to diagnose a fibromyalgia patient, but it's not easy to come up with the reasons and the cause underlying issues. So I'm going to present Ana Paola, and we're going to be talking about nutritional components and how to look at and how to treat uh, from a things that, from something that you can do inside of your home. So here we go. So Ana Paola, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hello, hello. I am fine. How are you? Oh, we're doing wonderful today. So we, we're going to get loud uh, and we're going to make yeah, it Yeah, we're so, going to get loud. So we're going to start telling <laughs> about fibromyalgia and we're going to start nailing this and because it's a, it's a huge problem that affects a lot of people. Uh, and uh, because it does have uh, a lot of dramas associated, many times the nutritional way is, is a way that you, the individual has control in the beginning. So let's start talking about that. I know you're going to share a screen and we're going to be going in, into that area. So as you set up the, the sharing of the screen, tell us a little bit about your approach as to how you're going to discuss the, our, our nutritional treatments for fibromyalgic patients. Well, first of all, I want to say that since it's such a broad pathophysiology, we're going to be really digging into each and every single one of the symptoms that is a that are affecting, affecting the patient with fibromyalgia. So we're going to go into that symptom and then we're going to start looking at different approaches, nutritional approaches, new foods, new nutrients, new amino acids, or well, maybe not new, but we're going to, we're going to explain how those particular foods can affect and can improve everything that is going on with this patient's symptoms. And as you said before, nutritional diet therapy is like one of the only things that make the patient feel like they have some sort of control. So that is something really important. Another thing that we're going to talk about is alternative treatments that have to come along with the nutritional approach maybe with pharmacological approach too. We don't want to really limit the approach of any kind of patient because everyone is different and they are allowed to think different. So we're just going to go through a, a whole new part of the, of the treatment of fibromyalgia and nutritional treatment and some alternative treat, treatments as well. You know, you mentioned um, uh, of the approaches. Uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, you're a master nutritionist and an educator in this process. So I'm very excited to to see what this has to offer because I'm going to also uh, add in as I go through the process with you. So take it away. Okay, okay. So we said that we, we want to treat exactly the symptoms and the path, pathophysiology of fibromyalgia, but since well, actually what I've noticed is that a lot of the criteria has been changing. So that is something that we might want to take into account. Most of the times we're not gonna see the same symptoms in, in each patient. So I want to be very clear on that. The patient has to be aware of what are the symptoms that are affecting, affecting their body with them. So that is something that I really want to clarify. So. 
uh, that will actually be part of the alternative treatment, but it has to come before the that first assessment. So, or it could be done in the process of healing, but yes, you have to be very aware of what is exactly what is uh, affecting yourself. So, well, fibromyalgia, a big part of fibromyalgia, as you said before, is central sensitization and the pain that the patient is suffering. So, so we might want to talk a little bit more about what is this pain sensation and how does it get so bad whenever uh, fibromyalgia starts to suffer it. So the first thing that we have to know is that central sensitization has to do a lot with the fact that excessive amount of glutamate, which we already said it before, glutamate is not wrong. It's actually needed. It's not like a bad thing, but when there are like high amounts of glutamate that they actually come through our brain barrier, uh, blood brain barrier, because it's so permeable, that is the thing that is going to start to affect the patient. So right now we want to see that glutamate, which are like the, like the blue balls are actually going to be the one affected the postsynaptic spine. So that is what actually enhances the pain sensation in some, in some patients. So this is something that we want to lower a little bit. And as I said before, the nutritional treatment is kind of a combination with uh, a combination of taking out some agents from your from your diet or just like uh, diminishing the amount that you are consuming and adding some anti-inflammatory or antioxidant or and antioxidant food for it to get better. So something that can really be helpful right here because as we've said, uh, how are you going to know that glutamate is actually affecting you? Well, most of this uh, glutaminergic excitability comes with a lot of pain, comes with irritation, comes with PMG, comes with IBS too. So be aware of those symptoms and then uh, Anna, when, you say I, I, when you mention yeah. IBS, uh, you're talking about irritable uh, bowel syndrome, correct? Yes. And what we've learned today, when I went to school, irritable bowel syndrome was considered diarrhea or constipation. Now we have what is called irritable bowel syndrome, you know, C and irritable bowel syndrome D for both. So what we now can relate to is that it is actually fragmented into other areas in irritable bowel syndrome, because I will venture to say that pretty much most of my patients that have uh, fibromyalgia do have intestinal issues. Uh, pretty much yeah. all of them do. So go ahead, continue. Okay, so we're going to talk about IBS and about the constipation or diarrhea that might come with those with those symptoms. But I want to stay a little bit more here in the glutamate portion. Um, well, have you taken glutamine glutamine to uh, as part of your treatment or your muscular development treatment? Yes, we use glutamine. Uh, we use glu we actually use GABA. Uh, we we focus mm -hmm. on making sure that the levels are maintained, and our neurological testing yeah. that we do specifically measures the level of glutamate within the bloodstream, also intracellular and extracellularly. So we, as you mentioned, gl uh, glutamine and glutamate, uh, the precursors. Uh, you'll you'll notice that they have cofactors that create the mm -hmm. GABA, you know, adrenergic or uh, at least the neurotransmitters that are occurring. So we measure these. Again, these are extremely, as you indicated, very, very important. Uh, we need them to function, but it's when they have too much of it, when the excessive, yeah. when the load is too high, that we have these excessive uh, depolarizations uh, and issues as a result of it. So yes, we do. Yeah. So that's exactly where I wanted to go. Glutamine and glutamate are not bad things. It's just like the fact that when there are too much, there will, they will well, glutamate specifically, specifically will translate to an excitotoxicity with, that would affect the patient. So what, what we can do to actually diminish this effect? Well, magnesium plays an important part because it actually has a cleft in the, in the synaptic uh, part of the glutamate receptors. 
and it will block the the entering of glutamate to the to this site. So it is very important. Another thing that you might want to take into account is the thing is very is very important too, and it will actually modulate the the excitatory response. So this is something that might, that we might want to take into account. Another very important part of the nutrition is vitamin B6, which is actually actually a cofactor of glutamine decarboxylase and will turn glutamate into GABA, which acts, acts like an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So that's exactly what you want to, to have. So, well, if you're having problems and maybe you just don't know what is going on with your brain, because as I said before, it might be, it might be difficult, but you might want to take into account that these are specific nutrients that you can add to your diet as maybe a supplement or maybe eat a lot of foods that contain magnesium, zinc, so and vitamin B6. In today's discussion, we will be discussing the magnesium, the zinc, uh, the B6 cofactors, uh, and uh, at least the, the modulation between the enzymes that's important along, but bringing it home, we're going to bring it to the foods to continue. Yes, actually. So yeah, another thing that we, that will actually be uh, helpful to reduce excitotoxicity will be omega-3 fatty acids. And I think that the, this has like a dual factor of well-being to it because the main thing is that omega-3 fatty acids can make like the cell membrane a little bit more fluid, and this could prevent any kind of excitotoxicity. But in the other hand, it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory uh, factor that we can that we can use to prevent a lot of uh, unsatisfactory symptoms of of fibromyalgia. So this mm -hmm. is something very important. Uh, about MSG and aspartame as part of the diet, I actually talked about this before and about the importance of knowing that aspartate and glutamate come, come in the diet in various sources. So what we want to do is actually use them as GABA, use them as part of the... Um, functions of our body that we want to enhance instead of going the other way around and actually affecting us. So if you are aware of these symptoms, you might want to take away the MSG from your diet and you might want to take away um, aspartame sweeteners from your diet. So that is something that is kind of easy to do in the practical sense. You can take away MSG, you can take away some sweeteners, and you can see if this elimination type of diet can actually enhance your well being. So that is something that I think it's easier to do instead of going like the whole way around. And just to see if there's like this specific symptom, you can take it away easy. But this is like a, an easy thing to do like a like a, um, yes, like an easy way out. Uh, oh. It's a simple thing to do, I guess, right? Yeah, it's like a simple thing to do. Uh, another thing is that actually excitotoxicity comes with oxidative stress and oxidative stress comes with neuroinflammation. That, so that is something that can actually come with can actually come from fibromyalgia and start to get worse. So we don't want to go all the way through that. So I think it's this is the part when the where the clinician has to be like very aware of the symptoms of their patients. So don't don't just like say like no, how could it be possible? No, you're just stressed. Take this pill or anything. No really dig into the patient's issues because you don't know what is happening. And if you just ignore it, it would eventually get back to the to that patient, which could be possibly depressed. And you don't want to have that on your shoulders. At least that's what I'm thinking. So 
you have to really dig in into the symptoms. You know, what? one of the things is, is that uh, the beauty of today is that the technology is such that uh, it's not my opinion mm -hmm. anymore. It, we can actually assess the, the blood factors and determine if the individual has a high level of oxidative state. So before it was kind of, we had a normal blood work and we had what we call the SMAC24 or a CBC or a simple metabolic panel. Today, we can actually assess the minerals, the cofactors, and see the level of oxidative stress that the individual is metabolically in a quick moment of time. So that issue of understanding is really what is, is, is changing the advent of medicine in terms of understanding the oxidative state. Reactive oxygen species uh, there are many that cause oxidative stress in the body. However, what we need to do is we need to not only find it, but we need to find natural ways to be able to mitigate this issue. So I noticed that you had there a certain amount of supplements there, resveratrol and green tea. Tell us a little bit about that, Anna. Yeah, so this, these are actually some uh, good antioxidants that could prevent this kind of reactive oxygen species uh, oxidative stress. So we want to focus a little bit more in the kind of food that might be able to, to give a little bit more of resveratrol, but you have to make sure that you don't have to take a lot of wine to get resveratrol. You can actually take it as a supplement <laughs> and take like the so, alcohol. So wait, part wait, of wait, it. wait. Are you telling us that, 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 uh, having five or six glasses of wine are not necessary anymore? Maybe. No, yes, uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. You don't have to take like five of it. And actually, a funny thing to mention is that dark chocolate, I mean, it's chocolate, it can have and we're talking about dark chocolate. The thing about dark chocolate is, is that it has to have more than 80% of it has to be 80% of dark chocolate, non milk, milky chocolate kind of thing so you have to make sure that you get the right chocolate when you want to try this out another thing is the amount the amount is very important um i don't know if you've ever bought like this uh bars of dark chocolate at your absolutely. house absolutely yes absolutely okay so there's like this this thing because it has a lot of fat which I, which is kind of good because it has antioxidants but we have to make sure that the ratio is good so the right amount for you for you to take of this dark chocolate is just like one small square a day so that is the kind of of amount that will actually provide you some kind of protection antioxidant protection that will be able to alleviate the ROS uh, potential effects in oxidative stress. So you have to make sure that if you want to take a glass of wine, don't take the whole bar of dark chocolate. I mean, you have to like cut the little square and eat it in order for you to get like good results and do not gain weight in your in your whole like um, journey to get better. So you, that you know is what? like a very you, important you, takeaway. You've, you've made me think about something um, because as part of many people who are wine connoisseurs, they do get dark chocolate and they, and they, and they sometimes use a red wine uh, to enhance the flavor. So that's an opportunity where you have two, a, one glass of half a glass of wine and probably a little bit of dark chocolate. It will amplify the, um, I guess, the experience. The uh, in the process. Yes. 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 And if you think about it, maybe we're just like a little bit, we're still thinking about social distancing. And I mean, I think, okay, we're thinking about social distancing, but that's like a good thing that you can have with your pop, with your husband or with your wife. You can just drink a glass of wine, take a little bit of dark chocolate and have your antioxidant party uh like in the night or have a like good weed or something like that so it could mm. actually be enhancing the resveratrol properties and actually providing you like a good time for you to relax or to enjoy your time in this like trying period of life that we're leaving so 
I, I don't know that those are my ideas. The, and you're you can correct. Tell me. Anna, I will tell you this, that I've had more patients now with the exacerbations of the symptoms of fibromyalgia. Uh, since ever before, being at home and this disassociation from humans uh, and this limitation of movement uh, has created a inflammatory fest for the body. So what we need to do is have ways. So this is a great option here. I love this. Yeah. So that is actually like the very functional part of resveratrol and where you can get it and how you can pair it. Now we are wine canisters and look at us. But we need to know something that actually resveratrol can actually provide a lot of microglial activation and prevent it to go to the phase two activation of microglial. So instead of getting all pro inflamed and producing neuroinflammation, they will actually mitigate the effects of these pro inflammatory factors and the pro inflammatory effects of neuroinflammation. So I mean, thank you, Red Ritual. You just gave us, you just gave us like a lot of good uh, ways options. to. Yes, yeah, I also a lot of noticed. Options. Yeah, and you said green tea too. Uh, the polyphenols, you mentioned yeah. that too as well. We were doing that. And let's so elaborate on that one too as well. So, yeah, you were saying before that we can actually now measure a lot of our antioxidants, uh, anti antioxidant enzyme power. And that is very important. So right now in this research article, what they, what they actually found is that supplementation of green tea and its powerful polyphenols can improve the um, SOG activity. So that is actually something that you can take away from the, from the green tea inclusion of your diet. So another thing, Maybe just like a simple tea bag of green of green tea won't be uh, helpful, but you can supplement green tea uh, so that it could be like a little bit more powerful. You can just use it as, for example, if you want to take a smoothie instead of just pour, pouring water into it, you can make like a small green tea and like keep it into in the fridge and add it to your smoothie. And that way you can introduce green tea to your diet in a very simple way. Anna, today we have, uh, we actually have the pills of green tea mm -hmm. extract, uh, about 500 to 600 milligrams uh, a day is, is, is suffice. So there are easy ways of doing that. If you don't have the ability to go get it, most simplifying uh, your dynamics in your diet protocols. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is actually really, really important. It's, and it's like a good way of, providing an extra like an extra layer to your diet I think I just went backwards just let me yeah go ahead right <laughs> get it right there you, go. there you go okay another thing that we might want to talk about or we actually need to talk about is the muscular pain and the muscle the muscle metabolism that comes along with uh, fibromyalgia patients because something that you that you can actually see in patients is that they are not going to be very active because it hurts. So um, a lot of a lot of studies, studies try to find out what was actually happening. They actually thought it was like lactate acid, but it had nothing to do with it. It's just still the sensory effect and the uh, the effects that this kind of um, pathophysiology has over mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is something that we can actually take a lot of this vitamins that I'm going to vitamins and micronutrients that I'm going to talk a little bit more about them in a while so that we can apply it to the diet. So uh, let me just um, kind of begin that right here, because one of the things mm -hmm. that I, I want people to know is that fibromyalgia really any human, doesn't matter who you are, you could be the most uh, well-adjusted individual, any human who has pain for greater than three months, 
uh, starts having depressive overtones. Uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're the most happy person in the world, uh, it will affect you. And as it affects you, it totally devastates the family life. Okay. It devastates your outlook. It, it makes you suffer from sickness syndrome. You don't want to go out. You basically become really much relatively more introverted uh, in the situation of today because today we're used to going out, but we're limited. So on top of that, you don't want to do anything. So it's very imperative that we understand the symptoms uh, of the issue so that we can break it down. So Anna's going to go over the, uh, the these components to assist people, but I want you to, to know you, we're not going crazy when we have fibromyalgia. There is things physiologically yeah. occurring yeah. that actually uh, do not need an SSRI uh, or maybe uh, an analgesic or some sort of uh, uh, corticosteroid for it. So let's talk about the ways we can fix this. Go ahead, nitric oxide. Go ahead. Yes, sure. So this is something that we're actually, well, nitric oxide, we know that it's very, very useful in cardiovascular disease and how we can actually dilate everything. And it's, it's very good for your arteries, but it's not precisely good for fibromyalgia suffering patients. Uh, we already know that fibromyalgia is actually a little bit more, excuse me, a little bit more common in females than in men. So something that has been brought to life is, to light is that actually the nitric oxide can actually exacerbate the pain the pain effects in this kind of patient. So they might want to, and it's like the same thing that we're talking about uh, with glutamate. You want to have the right, amount, the right amount of nitric oxide, but still you want to stay away from those uh, very powerful foods that are, trigger, that are triggered for nitric oxide production. Most of the patients have reported that they can actually uh, kind of associate the symptoms when they eat like citric fruits, like uh, I don't I don't know why I want to say onions, but oranges, lemons, uh, even uh, strawberries can be like very acid at the time, and tomatoes can actually produce a little bit of more pain, or they are associated with that. Something that we have to mention in this kind of studies is that most of them are just like kind of subjective questionnaires. So, I mean, some people can feel that same pain when they introduce tomatoes and citric fruits to their diet and another person might not feel that way. So right now, what we want to, what we want to, uh, introduce our foods that can actually regulate the nitric oxide content inside the muscle. So pomegranate, citrus fruit, fruits, which I already told you, some people might say that they can feel a lot of more pain when they introduce them to their diet. Walnuts, rocket lettuce, spinach, and L-citrulline can, well, that is actually inside of watermelon. So this was like very like novel uh, information. Anna, Anna, now that you mentioned that, um, as you mentioned that, walnuts, black or dark chocolate, uh, walnuts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we got centers uh, in Whole Foods that have the nuts and the dark chocolate together. And that yeah. adds to this story. Excellent. Yeah. So that is like something that could be very useful as a snack. Like it's like practical, that's gonna be the word of this of this uh, webinar right now. It's going to be practical for us. Practical. Well, another thing that we have to mention is that homocysteine that seems to be in a part of any pathology as well is part of fibromyalgia. Uh, a lot of high levels of, of homocysteine has been found in surface spinal fluid, fluid in the brain of any uh, fibromyalgia patients. So this might be related to musculoskeletal pain. So what you want to do is that you want to take that vitamin B12 inside your body through a lot of foods. And these are like very simple foods. And when we start talking about foods, like a little bit later in this, in this, uh, 
in this like uh, talk right here, we're going to start to see that there's a lot of fish involved in this, in this uh, approach, in this nutritional approach. Uh, I went backwards again. So, okay. Well, uh, as you fix that, go ahead. Um, you know, homocysteine is a notorious uh, um, cellular byproduct that uh, we use to measure inflammation and 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 overall uh, oxidative st stress. Uh, we've also learned that uh, homocysteine can be actually bound to by N-acetylcysteine too, as well. Not only for the glutathione reactions and the axon ox our main antioxidant, which is glutathione, uh, but it actually NAC N dot C, N dot A dot C, and acetylcysteine can actually bind to homocysteine and help eliminate it from the body. Okay, we're going to talk about N-acetylcysteine a little bit later because it's actually Sorry. like a, <laughs> it's like a binding point between so many different uh, micronutrients. You will see later that all of these different micronutrients, all of these different uh, byproducts of metabolism actually come together into, into a very uh, like established plan because they have antioxidant power, they have anti-inflammatory power, they can actually enhance the absorption of other, uh, of other vitamin or other micronutrients, that it's like the same thing that happens right here with vitamin C and, and the absorption of magnesium. It could actually, when there is vitamin D deficiency, it can actually interfere with magnesium absorption. So what do we need uh, magnesium for? Well, we need it because it's actually part of the a synaptic uh, system that we have in our brain. So if we don't have enough enough magnesium in, in our brain, then a lot of glutamine is going to come in and the excitotoxicity is going to come through. So this is why we have to, we need to have vitamin D in our diet to enhance the absorption of magnesium. So another thing that has a lot to do with mitochondrial dysfunction is that it, its deficiency can actually affect the production of ATP, which is like our energetic, uh, like uh, machinery. Like our, yes, yeah. it's our energetic machinery. We can pay with ATP all the things that we want into our in our body. So that's like our our coin. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Another thing is that. Well, we know that depression, anxiety, problems with with the sleeping procedure has a lot have a lot to do with fi in fibromyalgia patients. So, low levels of vitamin vitamin D has have been uh, associated with depression and anxiety. So, that is something more that has to do with this pathophysiology. And another thing is that it is actually linked to myopathy and severe muscle weakness. So this can actually affect so much a patient that it can lose the mobility, the mobility of the legs. So vitamin D is like a very important part of this, of this nutritional approach. And I know I already talked a lot about magnesium, but it seems to be like another like, as I told you before, like a very like compounding part of this nutritional approach. So magnesium deficiency has a lot to do with the low grade chronic inflammation, uh, increases the levels of substance of substance P, which is like an inflammatory that can actually promote uh, excitotoxicity along with glutamate, because when the blood brain barrier is so it, uh, has permeability and it can make the glutamate pa the glutamate pass and along comes the substance the substance P. So this is actually something that we want to look at. Another thing is that it's uh, related to uh, increased levels of reactive C protein, which is an inflammatory marker, and this has a lot to do with uh, chronic sleep deprivation and this is like a very focal part of the FM pathophysiology and this is why 
there is like a very direct portion of this of this condition that has to do with the sleep deprivation. deprivation. Uh, once you can't sleep, then the growth hormone will, levels will come down and this will actually affect the insulin-like growth factor one. And this is actually associated with a loss of synthesis of muscle. So that is one way that magnesium can actually be affected as well. Another thing, is that once the insulin-like growth factor uh, is affected, it can actually translate to insulin resistance. So once again, magnesium can be actually in can be uh, affected by. Well, it plays like a very important part in this part of the pathophysiology, and ultimately. Now that we're talking about insulin resistance, uh, most of the people that suffer from uh, fibromyalgia can actually be affected by a cardiometabolic disease. So this is something that is part of the nutritional guidelines. If you have a patient with fibromyalgia, you first want to uh, focus in regulating the 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 metabolic effects of a cardiometabolic disease that is lingering right there in your patient. So you have to take care of the metabolic markers. You have to take care of the insulin resistance. You have to take care of the weight. You have to take care of the waist and the waist ratio. You have to take care of that for well, the waist circumference. And you have to take care about the visceral, uh, the visceral adiposity. So that is like very important as well because those those very important four factors will affect the inflammatory milieu in which this patient will be developing the disease. So you have to take care of your patient's symptoms. You have to take care of their of your patient's markers. Just don't go. You have to be careful with that. And here I have like some foods that are actually high in magnesium. So this is like the first time I see avocado in my, in my presentation, which is great. We've talked about spinach as well. We've talked about dark chocolate. So, and almonds, which are actually like a staple of this kind of uh, functional nutritional approach of fibromyalgia. Um, the last, uh, well, not the last, because we're going to keep talking a lot about micronutrients, but the last right here is selenium. So uh, selenium has been linked to these disease that is quite, uh, that is called white tissue disease. It, it has only been seen in animals who are uh, eating from selenium depleted soils. So it's not very common in, in humans or it hasn't been seen in humans in a long time, I guess, or not reported. But uh, one thing that we have to take into account is that selenium is a big part of the antioxidant enzymes, just like glutathione peroxidase. And those are like the kind of enzymes that you might want to look at when you're, when you're taking into account that fibromyalgia develops in a pro-oxidative ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So these are like the kind of fruit of vegetables and, and, and fruits that can provide selenium. Another thing that we might want to talk about that here is like another part of why um, NAC and acetylcysteine takes like a whole big part of it it's because it is a very important precursor of GSH that, I, that it is glutathione and it's like a very important enzymatic enzyme that will create the antioxidant milieu which you want actually to be promoted in this kind of condition. So GSH is the precursor of glutathione peroxidase GSH by itself, it's like a very important reactive, reactive oxygen species scavenger. So 
you might want to take like a great look at it because it's very important. And something that I found that could be like a huge part of this nutritional approach is that glucophyne, it's very difficult to take as a peel or as a supplement. So you might want to take away, you might want to take as a supplement the precursor of GSH, that is N acetylcysteine. And this is like a huge part of every single protocol of supplements that it's aimed to treat fibromyalgia. So that is like a huge part of the treatment. You know, as uh, we learn in, um, in functional medicine uh, and their approaches, glutathione is the major antioxidant of the body. It is a system that is supported by all organ systems, uh, is needed by all organ systems for the antioxidant oh, so, yeah. approach. Go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely love this part of it. So we now have some, some foods here that we can actually address that are important. Continue. Okay. And I know we already talked about the function of omega-3 fatty acids and the fact that it can actually promote or, well, modulate the ketotoxicity effects in the, in the brain. But something that we really want to look at are the, the, um, the foods that are going to provide enough omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, I had like a lot of, uh, like I had the amazing opportunity of going through a lot of information about omega-3 fatty acids and fish. And something that is really important to say is that while supplementation can be a huge part of the fibromyalgia treatment, a lot, or let's say that most of the omega-3 fatty acids that come from fish are actually the ones that are going to be absorbed by the body. There is like this theory that omega-3 fatty acids have to be um, joined with protein in order for them to fully, to fully be absorbed by the body. So while you might have a supplementation that has like a gram of, of omega-3 fatty acids, you might be actually like be able to fully absorb like just like half of it. And while if you have like a macro that has like, I don't know, 200 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acid, acid, you might be able to absorb the whole 200 milligrams from the, from, the, from the actual fish, from the actual tissue of the fish. So this is something that has really marked me from my whole life. So if you don't like fish, please supplement with omega-3 fatty acids, I'm pretty sure that you can find a lot of good products out there because it's a very good, uh, like a very good nutrient. It's an essential part of the, of the dietary intake. But if you like fish, oh my God, you're gonna have like so much better, like I'm not gonna say like a better quality, but it will be easier for your body to absorb the omega-3 fatty acid coming directly from the fish. Uh, so as I told you before, I had like a lot of time studying this kind of different fish and my maybe I don't have these names in English, but this was like a very special uh, research paper for me it was about how can we uh, provide enough omega-3 fatty acids be, uh, without like spending a lot of money. So we actually, it's actually not in dollars, it's in pesos. So like about 3.20 pesos will allow you to have 100 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acid from the Apteris which is mackerel, I think. So right now in the United States, the most important, uh, Omega-3 fatty acid provider might be linked to, well, is salmon and herring, which is actually what we call cintilla here in Mexico. And it's actually three pesos for you to get 100 milligrams, which 
is not enough, but I mean, you can have, no, it's 230 milligrams. So let me ask you this question. Size. I'm noticing your graph there. Yes. And, I, and I noticed that Albacore uh, is, is Albacore, high. Yes. It's a good price ratio and a good price. It's amazing. For, yes. Yeah. So tell, uh, that, that ratio, and that's something that's found in pretty much all the stores um, in, in, in different formats. So yeah, I can see yes. that understanding the value set is important here. Yeah, you can find it at stores just like that, just like that, like just like the normal fish, or you can buy them in like a can. So actually can tuna, can albacore, can everything can be like a very useful and practical part of your, like a practical part of your market uh, buying techniques and to bring it all the way to your fibromyalgia and nutritional treatment. So uh, I really like this, this paper right here. It was one of my favorites. So yeah. Uh, you can. Um, so, you know, when I actually determine the oxidative state of individuals, I actually uh, recommend the omega-3 uh, products, usually around between minimum a thousand milligrams, but I push it sometimes to four to 5,000 milligrams of omega-3s. Um, it does have a lot of anti-inflammatory effects and a lot of, uh, um, it diminishes neurotoxicities as well as cytotoxicities. Um, so it, it's very important to consider that in our, in our diets, uh, a little digression, yes. our, our, our forefathers, our grandparents always let, give us cod liver oil, uh, for that particular reason, omega threes, um, the science is in, uh, omega threes, EPAs, uh, more, the higher DHA. the EPA, the better the DHA, mm -hmm. uh, those are the very important ones. And depending on the product line, uh, which we do serve those, however, that they, patients have a lot of options in terms of this. So when you go to the store, yeah. please make sure you look at the quality that you're getting. Yes, that's sure. That is so true. And like I said before, a very important part of the research process that we did is that uh, we wouldn't have like any people to try them on. Like we would try to develop new recipes, like fish recipes for our patients. And most of them, they don't like fish because it's funny tasting. I mean, it's not if it's not chicken like most of the people they don't want it so uh i mean that's why supplementation is like a very important part of it uh and a very important part of the name of this polyunsaturated fatty acids is that they are actually called essential fatty acids because our body just can't produce them so we have to take them from our diet and if you're not eating a uh, fish, then you're probably not getting enough polyunsaturated fatty acids coming from EPA and DHA. So uh, take into account that part of your dietary preferences because there will be the time when you're trying to treat some patients and you, you have to evaluate that and you have to negotiate what you're going to supplement, what you're going to give, if it's possible for them to get it in like a simple uh, market or a simple convenience store. So it's, it's very important. It, there's like a lot of limitations uh, of a fish. There is, there are a lot, a lot of limitations. So, okay. I, Let's you get know, back I, to the you're, point. You're, you're going to take us to the uh, FODMATS diet as well? or are Yeah, we... you know, I like that diet. I really like it. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the FODMAT diets. <laughs> okay. Well, and this is going, going straight and all the way back to the pathophysiology of fibromyalgia. IVS, depression, lack of sleep is like a very uh, simple thing or not simple thing. It's like a symptomatology that, that patients are going to report to you once they are in your private, in your private office or in your private practice. So... A lot of these uh, different like depression and bipolar spectrum disorder are associated with dysfunctional dietary habits. And by dietary habits, I mean a lot of things that are going to be wrong with the diet of these patients. And I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's bad. It's something that 
that it's happening when you are depressed. I mean, you don't want to get up, maybe. So maybe you're just calling for some, like, I don't know, McDonald's or any kind of food. So pro-inflammatory food. So there are a lot of dysfunctional dietary habits in this patient. And one of them might be associated with the fact that they are going to a lot of food that has a lot of pro-inflammatory factors, and this can promote um, the IBS symptoms. So that takes us all the way to the treatment of IBS. And something that we have to talk about is the fructo oligosaccharide, disaccharide, and monosaccharide uh, diet, that it's like a very huge treatment in patients with IBS. Something that we have to take into account with this diet is, is that it's actually associated with weight loss and can actually lower the waist circumference in your patient. So this can, well, if you think about bloating, well, well, your bloating will be exactly in your abdominal part of your stomach. So, well, that is actually affecting the patient. And there are a lot of uh, subjective quality of life questionnaires that are associated with fibromyalgia and how patients with fibromyalgia have a lot of troubles with accepting their body. So this is actually one of the diets that can like give like a whole 180 turn to the life of these patients by actually improving their quality of life, dropping some weight and improving the waist circumference uh, measures. So this, I think this is something like really awesome. Something about FODMAPs is that it's actually an elimination diet. We have to take away um, many foods uh, via uh, a dietary questionnaire, like which kind of food do you think that is causing you to bloat late at night, for example. And most of the patients go exactly, go, go directly to either milk, uh, dairy products. Uh, they can actually have a lot of trouble with broccoli, cauliflower, and onion, garlic, various spicy foods that can actually be a huge part of the bloating pro problem. And the only thing that this uh, FODMAP diet is trying to do is is that it's trying to take away all of the disgusting symptoms from IBS and just give them a better quality of life. So you just don't want, this is like a very important part of every elimination diet. You just don't want to take away the, the foods from the patient. You want to give an alternative food for them to fill out that empty space that you're going to take out. Anna, yeah. to, to add to that, uh, what we do also at the office is sometimes you may not know which of the foods that are causing those food yeah. sensitivities or these issues. And we actually do quite a few food sensitivity evaluations. Uh, food, sensitivity, food sensitivity is different than food allergies. So it, yeah. it, what, to understand the difference um, is that we have to look at the molecular component of each each type of foods, for example, corn. There are hundreds of biomarkers in corn that may cause inflammation. We may find out that we didn't realize that corn was in ketchup itself or, co or, co oh, or, yeah. corn, or corn byproducts were in Worcestershire sauce. So what yeah. we have to do is we have to find what are the things, because otherwise we're shooting into the map. Um, as you indicated uh -huh. earlier, the elimination diet does sense uh, able to fix the issue in many cases. However, if we start eating and we don't know exactly which molecular component was causing the food sensitivity, that is one of the things that we want to do while we assess which type of diet works well with you as we as we adjust your diet, as we fix it. Uh, you mentioned also a little bit earlier information regarding uh, body weight uh, and, 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 and hip cir circumference difference. For that, we actually assess anthropometric measurements and bio um, measures to uh, at least body composition assessments to see how much water, uh, how much inflammation you have at that moment. So we can actually how see- How much permeability. Exactly. So as we do that, um, we can actually now measure the activity between inter and extracellular activity through phase angles that actually give us an insight as to all overall health and overall inflammation and overall cellular health. So we got a lot of tools in, in our, in our, in our, in our uh, arsenal to be able to yeah. mitigate, manage, 
and to be able to figure out what it is other than just kind of covering it up with some sort of a yeah. you know, blast approach. Go ahead. Yeah, and something about the fun method is that it, it has to take a challenge uh, period after you take all of it, all, after you take some foods out of your diet. So with that approach of testing without just testing it, it can actually provide like a, can actually take out the challenging part of this FODMAP diet and allow the, pa the patient just to eat what they need to eat, uh, give some alternatives to if you might want to, if the patient prefers to have that kind of food, but you have an alternate, an, uh, uh, an mm -hmm. alternative, then you can provide it to them and that can actually improve the way that they are. Um, they can stick to the diet a little bit more. So testing should always come first. And the food sensitivity test would be like something that I would eventually go if I'm seeing that this patient has persistent symptoms of IBS. So this is very, very important. Um, Something that actually, as, as I told you before, we were talking about uh, nutritional deficiencies and how sometimes the dietary patterns and habits of these patients are not like the optimal. So most of the times, uh, obesity is something that is commonly seen in this patient, in those patients with fibromyalgia. So uh, this is associated with the fact that they rather have a lot of carbohydrate load in their diet and stay away from the protein up uh, from the protein uh, part of it, and they want to take away the vegetables. So, uh, actually, what what has been seen is that they have very low levels of isoleucine, leucine, and valine, which are very important uh, for muscle synthesis, for muscle growth and for muscle strength. So if you don't have these very important amino acids in your diet, you have to make, uh, well, it's actually going to affect your muscle like function right there. Another thing is that they have very low levels of tryptophan and tyrosine uh, in, in in their bodies so that that would actually affect their neurotransmitter functions because tryptophan is like a very um, powerful neurotransmitter. And as I can see here, I misspelled tryptophan. I'm so sorry. Now it's all better. So tryptophan <laughs> is like a, <laughs> it's like a, a very important amino acid and Maybe this is so related because it, it is related to uh, fibromyalgia because it's the precursor of serotonin and melatonin. So sometimes what happens with tryptophan is that it goes to another uh, metabolic pathway, with, which is this uh, kinarine uh, um, metabolic pathway. And it can actually affect the way that people would eventually feel because serotonin is like a mood enhancer, let's just say it like that. And melatonin is a sleep inducer. So this is the way that uh, deficiencies in tryptophan can affect patients with fibromyalgia. Uh, sometimes tryptophan gets turned into this other compound when there are like a lot of inflammation, inflammatory cytokines uh, involved in this process, like we're talking about the ecosystem. So if we want to keep the tryptophan going the way that we want to, we have to lower inflammation. Of course, sometimes kinorenic, kinorenic acid can be very functional because it's actually uh, a down regulator of excitatory problems. So uh, this is actually something that we want to have, but we want to, we rather have tryptophan go to this other way, the way that it produces serotonin and melatonin. So this is very important oh, as well. So 
we want to talk about foods that have a higher amount of tryptophan of tryptophan so i want to talk a little bit more about spirulina and also mention that fish is one of the main components that might provide a lot of tryptophan to your diet so fish fish cod that is very important and as you as you were saying before cod oil was like one of the things that our grandmothers would like us to have a lot of that in our supplementation kit when we were kids so yeah so have you ever listened have you ever heard about a spirulina absolutely we use it in the office yes well this is like a very uh like a very interesting supplement well it is actually an algae so we might not be able to get it like that because I've never seen a spirulina in the market, but I have seen the powder spirulina supplements, which can actually be great for, um, for a smoothie. You can use it for a smoothie. You can use it, you can use it in your protein uh, smoothie. You can use it in your protein bowl, actually. So that is something that we want to talk about. Another thing is that it's very high in carotenoids that are like very important antioxidants. And it has a lot of omega-3 fatty acid. It is actually a very good source of magnesium, iron, and zinc, and selenium. So we've been talking about all of these different uh, micronutrients that might add to the to the anti-inflammatory processes or to reduce excitotoxicity. And this is one of the top uh, supplements or top in ingredients that you might want to add to your diet while staying away from the other ones. It's just like a combination between what yeah, you want and as, to- Yeah, and as you, as you indicated, taking in the natural form is always a more optimal because there are certain phytonutrients and phytochemicals that are there to complement each mineral in a natural way. So nature has done a good way or a good process of putting it together. Sometimes yeah. taking zinc, um, as you indicated earlier, by itself is not the same take, thing as taking zinc within spirulina. So it, it really is a, uh, a method to be able to complement the, the dietary changes. Sure. So, uh, well, Actually, uh, the main part of or the primary approach to to treat fibromyalgia is to stay a little bit away from pharmacotherapy. So a lot of patients uh, have gone through a lot of uh, processes while trying to stop their symptoms. So nutrition is a big part of this approach, but alternative and complementary therapies is like another big part of the treatment. Uh, actually, a lot of uh, patients have gone like uh, through acupuncture uh, sessions or even or either massage sessions, like in the first year of their um, diagnosis. So these play like a very important part of what the treatment is able to do for you. So yes, once again, it has a lot to do with the, with the subjective part of the symptoms that the, that the patients are feeling, but it can actually help a lot. So most of this, uh, most of these alternative therapies uh, revolve around acupuncture, massage, meditation, and mindfulness. And they have proven to be very effective, uh, but they can actually uh, have like a downside of it because most of the time they are compared with uh, some kind of placebo effect. And all of the groups they have like the same effects. They think that their quality of life is improving. They think that they have less muscle pain. So I think that whatever it is, the path of the healing path that, that you are going through, if you think that it's going to help, it's going to help. So sometimes you just want to be heard. Sometimes yes. it's just that. 
You know what? Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're we're going to take an intermission now. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to come back and add for additional foods in the process. So what uh, right now we have a monster uh, and it's a pretty much a good two month long process of teaching about fibromyalgia that we have planned uh, specifically in the treatment protocol. So we, we ask that you continue to watch our show. Uh, Anna, you've done an amazing job. We are learning more and more each day. We're going to bring the most advanced uh, level of information regarding fibromyalgia from the clinical side to the pharmacokinetic side uh, and bringing the right types of providers to explain those things. Uh, nutrition is a big thing. We're going to be working on nutrition for the next couple of weeks. Uh, I wanted to give you a preface as to our approach with this. Um, and Anna, I want to tell you that today has been awesome. We have been online for literally over an hour and we want to make sure that yeah. our people can kind of, uh, hey, it's fun, isn't it? It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> but what, one of the things is, is that uh, uh, if you go ahead and take off and I take off your uh, or stop sharing your screen so we can see you, um, yeah. we want to be able to bring in the the your team here that you have a good team uh, on your side to be able to present these new subject matters. So uh, I want to thank you for being with us on Saturday. Uh, we look forward to being with you during the week with bringing our health coach to kind of figure out ways that we can assess specifically the disorder of fibromyalgia in the neuromusculoskeletal oh, yeah. arena. So I want to thank you all. And I want to tell you, I appreciate your time and uh, blessings to all of you. So Anna, we'll see you on the other side of things. Okay.